Hello everyone, I'm Mike Levin, and today we're going to talk about the differences between different programming languages. And when you talk to people, you'll often hear that it doesn't really matter what language you start out with, you can transcend the limitations of any language and do good work regardless. And th while that's mostly true, it does make a difference what language you start out with because it's going to be your first language and it's going to color most of your conceptions forever forward. No matter what more you learn, your first language is special. Also, like with a spoken word, certain languages lend themselves more to expressing certain ideas. Whether you speak Mandarin Chinese, or English or Cherokee, certain ideas are going to be easier, harder, uh, impossible, or a pleasure to express. And the same exists with programming languages. So this is the verses line. And most uh, computers in the early days used low-level languages because there was no other choice. And that is mostly assembly language. And that is versus high-level languages, which are more like English. They're easier to program. The words are more familiar. Python would be a great example of a high-level language. And C is an example of the lowest level of the high-level languages. The next thing is compiled versus interpreted. And this used to be really important. Interpreted languages were just so slow, whereas compiled languages ran really, really fast. But compiled languages have to be compiled, so it was slower to develop. You had anywhere from a couple minutes to a half hour wait, waiting for your code to compile based on how uh, big your program was. Interpreted languages have a much faster workflow. You write, you run it, and you see how it runs, even though the running is slower. The next thing is whether your language is domain-specific, is the industry jargon, but they're just saying whether it's a specialized language. Especially in the early days where they were solving particular problems, a language might be written for scientific number crunching or for business, like Fortran and COBOL respectively, versus more general purpose languages. We're going to be focusing on general purpose languages. Those are the ones that you've mostly heard of. C, Java, Pascal, uh, Python, Perl, PHP, Ruby. Those are all general purpose languages. Specialized languages you tend to have not have heard of as much, but if you're in those fields, they're important. If you're in uh, statistical analysis, there's the R language. If you're in mathematics, there's Mathematica. But uh, as time goes by, general purpose languages even become more and more uh, better at doing those specialized problems. So it becomes less of an issue over time. The next one is seldom discussed, but very, very interesting. It's whether it's a metaprogramming language versus a non-metaprogramming. Now, I thought of other ways to say that, like static, maybe. But really, non-meta is the best way to say it. A metaprogramming language basically means it can modify itself. There's very little difference between the way the programming language stores data and programming instructions. And once, once data can be treated as programming instructions, you manipulate data, you're manipulating the programming. And right while the programming's running, it can change underneath of itself. And you can use those tricks to solve classes of problems that can almost not be solved any other way. The granddaddy language in that category is Lisp. And Lisp has some very big advocates out there, mostly Paul Graham. And he'll make the argument that it's the best language because it can do things that other languages can't. The problem is that you'll be on your own 
uh, you you essentially layer up layers of invented languages because metaprogramming languages are great at writing languages. So to solve your particular problem better than anyone else can, you layer on solutions and it's basically difficult for other people to step in and understand and take over your code. But it can be used for things like, uh, it was uh, Lisp programming for the self-driving car that won the DARPA challenge to navigate across the desert. So you know, when all else fails, sometimes you do resort to it, but we're gonna be focusing on non-meta languages. The next thing which is becoming more and more popular to talk about is whether a language is sequential versus concurrent. Concurrency is very important for scaling. When you need thousands of things to happen at the same time, your program essentially breaks up into a thousand bits, starts processing along these parallel lines and gets to the finish line much more quickly than sequential programming would. With multi-core processors, concern, concurrency is becoming uh, more popular in the mainstream, but it's been around forever. Uh, Digital Equipment Corporation had a um, server called the VAX, which had clustering, and you just basically threw together a bunch of these VAXs, and your processing happened quicker, and you could swap out and upgrade, and your programs kept running. Similarly, Ericsson has a language called Erlang, where you could swap out components, and your code just keeps running. It's an amazing thing. and. It's uh, concurrency is becoming popular these days because of something called Node.js on the server, which allows a language called JavaScript to run on the server for non-blocking I/O. So basically, websites work quicker, and things that happen in the background don't stop your website, don't lock up your website. So concurrency is becoming more popular, but it's a little bit more challenging to program. We're going to be dealing with a sequential language. Python is sequential. And in fact, its sequentiality is enforced with something called global lock. Hopefully they'll get over that limitation someday. But in the meantime, our focus is gonna be on a sequential language. The next one is probably one of the most hotly debated topics in programming, which is strongly typed. Strongly typed variables versus loosely typed. Now what this means is that when you're writing your code and you're getting up to assigning a, a variable to a value, in the strongly typed languages you have to say what type of variable it is, whether it's an integer or a string, what type of integer, how long the string, and in a loosely typed language you just you don't even have to declare the variable, you can just start using it. And traditional thinking is that strongly typed is better because it keeps the bugs out. Uh, the compilers at compile time look specifically for errors, uh, call them out, and you have to fix them. Now the truth is that the compilers are getting smarter on the loosely typed side, just like they're getting smarter on the interpreted side where execution speed is faster because they're building in compilers. At a similar location in the execution of the code, the interpreters are catching those mistakes. With loosely typed variables, ambiguity is your enemy if something can be interpreted in more than one way. Like if you say A plus one, is that supposed to be the value of a plus one, so it could equal two? Or is it supposed to be appending a one onto an a, so the answer is a one? So the interpreters basically, for the most part, stop running when there's ambiguity these days and make you fix that mistake before you can continue. And the advantage of loosely typed variables is faster development. So a program might be 500 lines of code with loosely typed variables, but a thousand lines of code with strongly typed variables because you have to, you know, declare all your variables, which can be a bottleneck. 
And then the, uh, the final thing, most people would say, oh, what about object-oriented? Object-oriented versus everything else. Well, the problem is, what is that everything else? It's a whole bunch of stuff. There's um, procedural, uh, imperative, functional. So it's not really object-oriented we're talking about. It's enforced programming style. versus non-enforced programming style. And for someone who doesn't program yet, it's, uh, it's a little difficult to grasp, but object-oriented was a very popular trend in recent years, and it caused a, uh, you know, a revolution in programming, and it, and it allowed a certain class of programs to be, cre to be created that were very difficult before because uh, code is a lot easier to manage and it's better for things like uh, physics engines that are behind games and it allows for emergent properties that you never explicitly programmed but it's not the solution for every problem you don't necessarily always want to be forced to think in the object-oriented style because that's what it is if you were to choose Ruby as your programming language you would be forced to do everything, no matter how mundane, in an object-oriented style. As opposed to Python, where you can program object-oriented if you wanted to, but you can also program in the very popular procedural style, or the uh, increasingly popular functional style. It's, Python is perhaps not your best choice for functional, but it's capable of doing it. And so when we go through our uh, education curriculum, the choices we're going to be making are high level, interpreted, general purpose, non-meta, even though Python has a certain amount of meta programming capabilities in it, sequential, even though I hope that'll change someday and that the global lock gets removed from Python, loosely typed, and non-enforced programming style, Python. And that's the differences between a lot of different languages. Uh, you could map all different languages to these uh, you know, things. I'll do a, just a couple of those before we leave so that you get a little perspective. Uh, low level would be assembly. Uh, compiled would definitely be C. Uh, specialized would be R. Metaprogramming would be Lisp. Sequential is Python, unfortunately, for now. Strongly typed would be Java. Even more strongly than Java would be Scala. Object-oriented would be C++ and Ruby. And for style, again, Ruby. High level is almost everything you've heard of. Interpreted is all the P languages that you've heard of, uh, Python, Perl, PHP, and the honorary uh, Ruby. General purpose, again, is almost everything. Non-meta is almost everything. Uh, concurrent, well, that's an interesting one. There's, there's a few languages out there that are specifically for concurrency. Erlang is one of them. Uh, I believe Clojure is one of them. Uh, loosely typed Python and non-enforced Python. And there you have it. Differences between programming languages. Thanks and I'll talk to you again soon.